Hey, welcome to Stand Energy Man. Happy lunch hour. It's my lunch hour again. Thanks for joining me. Stan Osterman here from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And I've got in the background here today uh, the Blue Planet Research Facilities on the Big Island in Puva'ava. And that's an 85 kilowatt PV array on their laboratory designed by Paul Pontio. And it's a beautiful facility. And if you ever get over to that uh, part of the Big Island and can get up there to take a peek at it, Paul might even be there to give you a tour or something. It's a great facility and it's where I take a lot of my inspiration for the microgrid work we're doing for the Air Force at Hickam and where I swap a lot of ideas and thoughts with him to, to try and keep things going here in Hawaii. So welcome and today we're, we're actually kind of Big Island centric today. Um, a few weeks ago I was on the Big Island for an energy storage conference and ran into a, a nice young lady who had an interesting uh, last name that seemed to be the last name of somebody I knew when I was a kid and it turns out they're sisters so we had a good time talking about you know what knucklehead I was when I was a little you know 13 14 20 year old guy and um, but now she's a, a big practicing lawyer here in Hawaii and doing all kind of great work in the energy world so I have Linda Kapunyai Rosehill here and uh, she's going to talk to us and tell us a little bit about what's going on in, in Hawaii in the energy world from a legal perspective and uh, and give us an idea of uh, maybe how we can do things better because uh, like I, I've mentioned before it's great to um, have a technical background and have a technical handle on all this energy stuff but you got to take a holistic approach you have to have the finances you have to have the legal background you have to have a whole lot of different the public relations piece you have to have a lot of those brought into the picture mm -hmm. or you could fail in any one of those areas so linda thanks for being here thank you i really appreciate thanks you coming inviting. out and uh, i think we're, we're gonna have a great show today so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background what got you started especially what got you started in the energy side mm -hmm. and uh, maybe a little bit about your connection to the big island sure first of all i live on the big island and i commute back and forth to honolulu so my office is located in honolulu but I have a little f hobby farm with some alpacas and oh, um, apple orchard and fun things like that on the Big Island. Uh, but I grew up and was raised here. Uh, I went to Kamehameha schools, graduated from there, went to UH, graduated from the law school. But to correct you a little bit, I don't do legal work okay. in that arena. Um, what my company does is government and community relations. Great. So my clients come to me to look at legislation that they that would harm their projects sure. or legislation that they want to support because that it would encourage the development of various energies, technologies, sure. or other issues that I represent. And, and for advice on how to deal with the community, if they're doing a new project or if they're having problems, getting their word out or the edu education of their community. Great. You know, nowadays you can't do a project, a large project, without that consideration of how do you talk to the community and who do you talk to in the community? What's the message? You know, and how do you position it so that they understand you know, what you want to be able to accomplish and why this is good for them? Well, thanks for really clarifying that because <clears throat> if you lived in Hawaii any length of time, you've seen a lot of projects that had a lot of hope and, mm -hmm. and uh, good best intentions uh, go down the tubes because uh, they didn't really have a good understanding of community uh, feedback and, and how to present to the community. Mm -hmm. I know as a National Guardsman, we used to work with the active duty all the time and say, hey, look, before you, you put something out in public, come and talk to us. Let us take it out in the community where we have families living mm -hmm. and we know the community and let us help you feel, get a feel for where you're at first mm -hmm. before you do it. And that sounds like you do that professionally um, for folks that aren't military and, right. and want to put projects out there. So right. that's important. That's like I say, this is a, when energy things are, are not just technical. There's a lot of components mm -hmm. to it. There's financial, the, the legal, the public relations. Yes. There's a lot of components to it. So. And there's a lot of, you know, misperceptions, mm -hmm. particularly when you're looking at sometimes new technology that people aren't familiar with. And as you know, being at that conference, the Big Island is just there's just so much potential on the Big Island. I mean, I think if you looked at the studies that have been done so far, the Big Island by itself could, via wind or solar, power the whole state. Sure. It has the, the resources to be able to do that. Now, nobody's looking at the cable anymore. And, mm -hmm. But you have to remember long term, that's something you want to keep in mind because as the population grows and the urbanization grows, 
you know, you may not have the ability to do the kinds of projects you've been able to do on Oahu um, just because there's no land or it's too expensive. Right. You know? And we, we all know that Oahu has the demand right. and the neighbor islands have the supply. Yes. And those energy, when you're talking energy, you know, that's, uh, and that's what was the whole start of the whole cable deal was mm -hmm. how do we get the wind power from Maui or Molokai or Lanai over to Oahu where we really need the power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a lot of that uh, discussion we had in Kona on the energy storage. That was one of the things that I really pushed hard to have hydrogen as part of the discussion because if you had to move energy between the Big Island and, and Honolulu mm -hmm. in a battery, mm -hmm. the battery would be so big you couldn't float it. Right. So there's there's other pieces to storage, energy storage, besides batteries. That's right. And that's why I wanted to make sure that, uh, and I, I work with Greg Barber to make sure that Paul and a lot of the other folks had some input mm -hmm. as as other ways of storing energy besides just batteries. And for me, hydrogen's a big one. And for Paul, hydrogen's a big, a big part of that. And, you know, we envision at some point, maybe 20 years from now, where the Big Island could be making hydrogen, making liquid hydrogen, and exporting it to the Orient or mm -hmm. to, to Pacific Islands, and it could actually be exporting energy. Can you imagine Hawaii exporting energy, like instead of oil, but we're exporting hydrogen in liquid form to other countries? Oh, that's and incredible. Yeah, so there's, Hawaii could go from a, a, an, an economy that's basically importing all their that's energy right. to an economy where we're actually exporting quite a bit of energy. See, and it takes kind of that long-term thinking even though you may not be ready to do it now and it takes a while in the development of the energy processes to get where it's economical or get where it's, it, it works the way it's supposed mm -hmm. to. But it takes that forward-looking thinking to, to see way out there. I mean, when I started with government, when I came out of law school, Governor Ariyoshi appointed me to as deputy director for the Department of Planning and Economic Development. And Governor Burns, previous to that, had started um, NELVA. You're not that old. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Fortunately, yes. <laughs> but it, it's, NELHA was at its beginning stages. Right. And NELHA happened to be one of the agencies that was under my jurisdiction as Economic Development mm -hmm. Deputy Director. So I was there when the first pipes were put in and the mishaps that occurred mm -hmm. originally with some of them. Um, I saw the first experimentations when they were bringing in the, the cold water and having the water condense on the pipes and then it would water strawberry plants that at that mm -hmm. time John Craven was doing. But now coming back as a board member, because I was, as you know, I was recently appointing back to the board, there's so much that has occurred in the 30 years, but it took somebody way back, Governor Burns' time, to envision that that would right. be a good place to do it, that there was potential in the energy arena, and that there was potential in the deep, cold ocean seawater. So, so back when you were doing that, was there a lot of pushback from the local community on the NELHA effort? Not really, not that I recall. I mean, in fact, I did the permitting for the host park side of it, and it required, you know, going before the council and meeting with the mayor and those kinds of political things that you had to do to get the permits through. And no, we did not get a lot of pushback. First of mm -hmm. all, you have to remember, that was a pretty barren area. There sure. wasn't much there at the time. Mm -hmm. So, and you were using a resource that nobody was using at the time, so it wasn't a competing issue. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing at that time that was of concern was that if you put this uh, NELHA into position, other developments along the coast, you had to be very careful what they were so that they didn't pollute the water, right. that you didn't have runoff, and you didn't have other things that might affect the purity of the deep ocean seawater for that resource. Well, things certainly have changed. And, you know, we've had experience recently with uh, Super Ferry and with 30-meter mm -hmm. telescope, and, you know, things get really controversial. And, and it's really frustrating, I know, for the business community and for a lot of folks that we spend a lot of energy trying to plan these things out, and at the last minute, you know, they, they get a lot of negative uh, attention mm -hmm. and sometimes ultimately fail. Mm -hmm. um, how, can we, how can we do a better job, you know, with all your experience, what, what recommendation can, can we get from you that will get these projects done, started the right way and mm -hmm. headed the right way and get them to fruition mm -hmm. so we can actually take advantage of some of these things? Well, you know, the model, if you will, of how you go about these projects has evolved during the years. I mean, early on, developers would come in with a project, it'd be fully developed, and then they'd go out to the community and they'd tell them <coughs> what they were going to do. Right. 
And actually, way back, they got away with it because we didn't have a real questioning community. Right. We didn't have the controversy that's out there now. And, uh, you know, local people don't speak up readily. Right. Um, we have a changing demographic, particularly on the neighbor islands. We have people that are a lot more aggressive, that are speak up more readily. Um, so nowadays, you really don't want to plan out your whole project. So you take it, you get a concept. You kind of know the parameters, you know you, the kind of timing you want, although the timing will never match up right. with the permitting process, and a budget. And what you really want to do is gather up people within the opinion leaders of the community that you're going to be dealing with and fill them out in the very beginning, involve them at the very beginning. Not to say that you have them change your project or, or build it for you or manipulate how it should be. But if you can take into consideration very on in the pro very early on in the project what it is their concerns are, you can incorporate those things in and you can mitigate some of those concerns. I, mean, I think a prime example which came to mind recently was um, you've been working in hydrogen and they had that hydrogen project that they were going to, a fueling station they were putting at Nelha. Right. And the origin, original location was up front. But Sopaji. Yeah, by mm -hmm. Sopaji, and it, and it was next to the academy uh, school. Right. And I had heard about this uh, a while back, actually, before, before I got on the Nelha board. Um, I have uh, friends who worked on the hydrogen project, and they told me that there was some issues there. And the issue really was that nobody had talked to the school and the parents at the school and the other community. So when they hear hydrogen facility, not being familiar with that kind of process or the technology, the thought is hydrogen bomb, this thing is going to explode. Mm. Our kids are right next door. Mm. Now that's a concern. Sure. So they didn't do the appropriate legwork to be able to do it where they wanted right. to do it. As a result, you know, they've changed the location for where it is, mm. but you wouldn't have had to go through right. that. You wouldn't have had to, or you would have selected a better location from the get-go mm -hmm. and not wasted all that time. Right. Um, what I really liked when we went on the tour, the storage energy tour, was the demonstration that Blue Planet did um, about hydrogen. You know, that it wasn't flammable, that it rises in the air so quickly that it, it can't explode. I really think that for that technology, for example, to succeed in the future, I would love to see a, a program put in place in the schools very early that looks and explains to children and their parents mm -hmm. what are the technologies that are coming up in the same way they did with an anti-smoking campaign or uh, sustainability and agriculture so that people children will eat healthier mm -hmm. those kinds of things you need to do the same thing in the energy arena because the energy technologies are changing so quickly and unless you can explain it to them so they understand why it's so important mm -hmm. and to have it in their backyard uh, we're going to meet resistance all along the way. Yeah, I, I had, um, a sh I did a show, actually we went on the tour at mm -hmm. Blue Planet uh, Research over in Puvala. And um, I actually videotaped Paul doing some of those demonstrations yeah. and put it on the show here just so people could look at it. And you know, hydrogen is just like any other energy storage component where you put energy together and it does have to be handled properly mm -hmm. or you can have problems with it. if you. If you don't, you can have a very flammable mixture, an explosive mixture with hydrogen and oxygen. But if you handle it properly, mm -hmm. and if you understand the properties of the hydrogen, it's much safer than most people think. In fact, most firefighters and most engineers that work in that field that I've talked to, they would rather, much rather deal with hydrogen than gasoline or even pure oxygen. Mm -hmm. Most engineers that, that do, exper or folk PhDs do work with pure oxygen, it's they're terrified of it, mm -hmm. and, but they'll work with hydrogen all day long. And, and people go, oxygen, don't we breathe oxygen? You know, it's, it's in the air, you do breathe it, but it still can be very dangerous. So you're right, it's, it is an education thing, and it's something we have to get out in front of. Mm -hmm. Well, we're coming up on a break here. We're gonna take a quick break, and I'll, we'll be back with Linda uh, Rosehill in a few minutes and talk some more about Big Island Energy and what we can do over there. Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues and events local and around the world. Join me. 
Hello, ha, how you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. I'm here, Gordo the Tech Star on Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm here with my good old buddy Andrew, the security guy. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Aloha. Good Thanks to have you, good, good to have Andrew here in the house. Please join us every Friday from one to one thirty, and follow us up on YouTube. And remember, as we say at the end of every show, how, how you, you doing? doing? I pity the fool who ain't watching this show at twelve o'clock on Friday afternoon. Stan, the Energy Man, watch it. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan the Energy Man here with Linda Rosehill, who kind of splits her time between the Big Island and Honolulu. I won't tell her to tell you which one she likes better because guys here in Honolulu might not like it. But um, thanks for being here with us again Thank today. You, again. you know, we did learn a lot at that battery store, the energy storage conference mm -hmm. at Nelha. And, um, and Nelha's got some interesting things going on there. Um, but when, when I first got into this job here, I really thought of energy in a fairly narrow perspective. I thought of it as like electric grid power and gasoline and diesel for your cars. Sure. And as I grew into what I do, I began to understand that, that energy is all around us. Whether it's, it's water on the, on the high end of a hill mm -hmm. or whether it's, um, whether it's uh, wind blowing past you or sunlight hitting the ground or just heat from the volcano or it, the energy is all there. It's, it's all in a different form, mm -hmm. but it's there already. So why are we bringing in all this fossil fuel when we have so much energy all around us, whether it's geothermal, ocean thermal, whether it's you know, uh, solar, wind, we have mm -hmm. all those things. We're so blessed with all these things. Why are we doing it? So some of the things going on at NOHA in conjunction with that, that conference was some new breaking energy storage technology. And are, are yeah. you familiar with any of the things they're trying to do? Yeah, one there? of them in particular kind of sticks in my mind because I thought it was novel. Uh, and it's a project wherein they use the sun's energy focused on mirrors to create heat that then makes energy and then what's not used is put into st a storage system the storage system being made up of rocks and then the case that they're looking on the big island is going to be lava rock you heat the lava rock up and then the lava rock during the night provides the energy mm -hmm. so i mean that's to me a perfect example of using a resources i mean that's so abundant really and my i know the initial description it was much less expensive than PVs mm -hmm. and other, some of the other storage that's available. Um, but, you know, we talked about uh, flow batteries. I learned a lot about batteries. I'm not an engineer, so I'm learning a lot. Uh, but just looking at all those various opportunities and the fact that Nelha has a, a, a storage, uh, storage test project mm -hmm. where they look at all the various options and see what works, what doesn't work, what the parameters are. I mean, I think that's what we really need, that kind of research to be able to go, then go commercial and use it on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, I mean, I think that's cutting edge. Um, of course, we have an OTEC project there, and Great. OTEC was there from the get-go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the original OTEC projects when, it, when we started out. It's become more sophisticated, perhaps more economical, and I think they're looking at it having commercial application more readily now than it did way back then. So. You know, we, you're right, we have resources that we should absolutely use. One of my clients um, on Kauai, I represent Kauai Island Utility Co-op, we're looking at um, hydro pump storage. Mm -hmm. Because you have these old reservoirs right. that were there from the plantation days, and you have them at varying um, elevations, elevations, where you can use that differentiation and elevation to have mm -hmm. the water come down during the day and pump it back up at night and run it down through through generators and so then it becomes for essentially firm power mm -hmm. you know and that's always been an issue of course with alternate energy because you've got it during particular times of the day but you don't have it at night unless you have the storage capability right. so that's something that's exciting and it actually can be done on all of the islands yeah pumped hydro is one of those great um, especially when you need a lot of power mm -hmm. and you need it for a long duration <clears throat> I have a great chart that I use when I brief people about different kinds of energy storage. And on the quick reacting side, you have capacitors and batteries, mm -hmm. and that gives you like microseconds out to minutes, maybe even hours. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your batteries, which are more in the uh, uh, minutes to hours, maybe even a day. Mm -hmm. And then you got flow batteries, which start in the hours and go out to maybe a, more than a day, mm -hmm. and then get you up to a, a, maybe a megawatt. 
But then you have the real long-term storage, and that's mm -hmm. where the hydrogen right. and the pumped hydro and even compressed air. You, know, you mentioned we're fortunate because we have these reservoirs already from the agriculture mm -hmm. uh, times that we can use, and that's one of the requirements. It's like pumped hydro works really well if you've got the topography, and right. if you live in a flat desert, pumped hydro is not, not going to do anything for you. Right. But you, as long as you match it to your local conditions and what you happen to have already, and in Kauai, pumped hydro is perfect. And so it gives you the chance when you have excess energy from all the solar, you use it to move the water, mm -hmm. and then when you don't have the solar power, you use the gravity to give your to, to generate oh, your power right. at night. And and the beauty a, of it is too that it's a closed system, exactly. so you're not using the water. Right. You know, it's just rotating back and forth mm -hmm. within the system. So the only thing you use as far as water is what's evaporated, you know, which is relatively minor. Sure. Considering most of those reservoirs are open anyway, sure. and there's evaporation. And you're going to have evaporation anyway. period. Yeah. Right. In this case, you're using it to something that's really beneficial, and that would bring the cost per kilowatt hour down, I think, considerably. Now, but you've got to be looking at all of these different options in order to get off of oil. I mean, mm -hmm. if, the, if the goal by Hawaii state government and by all of us is to get off of oil or to be less dependent on oil, you have to look at what are all the tools that are necessary. And the other thing you need to look at is how do you facilitate those projects within the governmental process, whether it's looking at the kinds of permits that are necessary and trying to make it less cumbersome I mean, you're always going to have some of the environmental issues that you're mm -hmm. going to have to address. That in and, in and of itself is a mountain to climb and expensive. But, you know, what can we do in government, for example, or in government policy making that will facilitate that development? You know, um, for the longest time, I mean, the PUC, for example, you know, giving them the resources to be able to move things a little faster on the docket. Um, having the community understand some of it, so maybe some of the protests that are coming up won't be there because they understand it better. Mm -hmm. um, what are the public policies that need to be put in place long term that will facilitate you know, these kinds of things? Be, you know, a while back, um, I know one of the things looked at by PUC was, you know, should you be separating out generation distribution? Right. You know, that has exactly. not been addressed yet particularly because we went through the next era deal and I think that had to be handled before you could move on to the planning docket and all the other things that they're looking at. But certainly if you're going to separate it out, then you have to be able to come out with policies via PUC, via mm -hmm. legislation or whatever rulemaking that will facilitate the development of the generation yeah. part of it. I don't think people understand that connection that you're trying to make because, you know, you have a lot of people that really, at this point, they're a little frustrated, especially if they've got they've invested in PV and mm -hmm. they can't connect to Hiko, right. and their and and their reaction is then get me off, and and that may sound great at first, but if they do come off, who's paying for the lines that go to their neighborhood anyway? That's right. It becomes more of a burden for all the neighbors who are remain connected, to that have to pay that that cost. If if everybody migrated away from the grid, everybody. Uh, or or even 50%, the other 50% would be paying for all that infrastructure. And when it's all lumped together in one kilowatt hour rate, <clears throat> it, it doesn't, it's transparent, you don't see it. But so, that's always been the argument for, you know, why, for example, well, that's been the argument against wheeling, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the utilities control all of the infrastructure and Right now, you cannot transport electricity across TMKs because you're not permitted to do right. that in the law. If you wanted to, for example, pursue the idea of microgrids, mm -hmm. which has been coming up at the legislature over and over and over, and lots of people want to be able to do that, they need to be able to address the wheeling right. problem. They're going to have to address how do you deal with um, Hiko Helco and you know, the, all the utilities for the use of those lines. The transmission. The transmission. Not the, not the production. Not right, the right. So how do you separate that out? What are the appropriate fees so that the mm -hmm. utility doesn't go under? Because, you know, the thing you have to remember is a utility, as a public utility, has a, has a mandate to be able to provide reliable power, firm power, across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not as easy as just, well, I want to do this, so I'll take my, my 
ball and my marbles and go someplace yeah. else. You know, we want to make sure that our utilities stay healthy mm -hmm. and that there's this balance that doesn't make them go under, but at the same time allows for new technologies to come on board and to flourish and to replace oil. You know, so that's, yeah. I think, the challenge from a public policy standpoint that the PUC, the legislature, and the rest are, are wrestling mm -hmm. with and have to wrestle with. You know, but you've got to have those discussions now. Right. You know, un unfortunately, some of these discussions should have happened a while back. I agree. You know, it, and I got waylaid a little bit because of the Nextera arrangement and, and mm -hmm. all of it being in PUC. Um, but now you're playing catch up. You know, nobody could come on board tomorrow with a microgrid or anything like that because you don't have the policies in place to be able to do it. That's, that's interesting you mentioned that because I agree. And the, I, I will bring, we'll bring in one other aspect here. We've been talking about the grid and we've been talking about 40% of, of the fossil fuels used. The other 60% is transportation. That's right. And, and so that's like my, my Kuliana. That's where mm -hmm. I, I look at transportation things and I go, yeah, well now I'm trying to get transportation off of fossil fuel and the grid is starting to become more and more uh, fossil fuel negative. I'm starting to compete with renewable energy for transportation. How do I solve my energy problems in transportation? There's policies in that area that need That's to right. come up. And there's solutions that work for both transportation and the grid. Right. So I'm hoping that the PUC and uh, the, the government sector overall, the energy office and the governor's office, they all look at these solutions in a more um, uh, ecosystem type of look, holistic. not holistic, holistic look, holistic right? In how they look at not it. just does it pencil out. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense in the long term, and and do we start changing our policies and maybe changing the way our electric grid is structured, mm -hmm. and the policies that direct, um, you know, rates and changes mm -hmm. and and infrastructure versus power generation, power purchase agreements. All those things need to be addressed now. It's like trying to solve healthcare without talking about. Um, tort reform or something. I mean, you're just kind of wasting your time. Well, you don't always have all the players at the table. Yeah. And that, that's a big issue. I mean, very seldom do we have, or has government had the forethought or ability to bring the right players to the table to say, okay, this is what we want to do. And I don't mean a plan because, mm -hmm. my no, goodness, there's been more plans and sure. studies and, and things in government that than you could forum, ever believe. Get people, but yeah. some way to be able to bring these ideas together coordinated in some fashion and have some real direction on what's needed. If you want to get from A to B, what are the public policies or what are the laws that need to be changed to get from A to B? Right. And quite frankly, government in and of itself is not able to do. It's, it's private sector who's doing those projects, who knows what they need to take in the way of money and resources to get us there, right. that has to have the input into that discussion. Okay, so now that we have the answer, <laughs> I can go right to Governor Ige and just tell him straight up, here's how we do it. You got Lindy here, me, just call us up. We'll give you all the solutions because we got to figure it out. But believe it or not, Linda, we've we've gone through a half hour talking about all this fast. stuff and it goes by really quick. And uh, I think it's been a great discussion and I appreciate your time here. Thank you. Um, and a perspective that we don't, we tend to not, av not avoid, but we tend to overlook a lot is not that the technical piece, but these other pieces, the public relations piece, the legal piece, the bigger policy pieces. So thanks very much for being Thank here you. and talking to Enjoyed us about it. it. And we'll have to have you come back again after we have re-energized the PUC and the public sector to get them all together. And have talk you talk about, about ag. I love to talk about ag. Okay, we'll have you back again. <laughs> Thank so you. So thanks, Lena. Appreciate it.